morning, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Ben from back, the Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning of Tswani University of Technology, that will do for uh, do the official welcome for us. Thank you very much, Prof, for your time. We really appreciate your participation in this webinar. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm um, Barnes van Wijk, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor. Thank you. Joey, for the upgrade for teaching, learning and technology at the Tswane University of Technology. It's really my privilege to open this three day morning seminar hosted by the Department of Computer Science in the Faculty of ICT, specifically focusing on ICT education and the teaching of computer programming and related assessment practices um, to novice learners. Scholars and educators in South Africa agree that computer programming is one of the most challenging subjects for tertiary and secondary students. And indeed, a longitudinal analysis of the performance of learners at TUT shows that a high dropout rate of ICT student is, students is often linked to a lack of foundational computational thinking and programming skills. Um, programming is indeed challenging for learners in high schools and universities. And if we add the severe lack of resources and the early exposure, lack of early exposure to programming concepts to almost all government funded schools in South Africa, the problem is indeed amplified significantly. The cognitive development <clears throat> of a student exposed to programming for the first time requires a deep understanding of both the way in which the student grasps certain concepts and in which they develop their computational thinking ability. Teachers and lecturers presenting programming as an introductory subject and have interacted to really with many of them are often criticized for either being too lenient or too strict when it comes to assessment. Nevertheless, programming education with a focus on pedagogy and assessment is a well-researched field. We are therefore delighted to have one such expert that has dedicated his academic career to this field, Professor Raymond Lister from the Sydney University of Technology in Australia with us today. He was and still is one of the lead researchers in this domain involving universities on different continents for more than 20 years. And we are looking forward to the insights that you're going to share, uh, Prof Lister. As part of the seminar, we are also elated to host local experts from South Africa, and those include Professor John Greilen from the Nelson Mandela University. Um, he has taught introductory programming for many years. He has also pioneered a very successful games-based approach to expose children of all societal domains, and especially learners in rural areas, areas to programming concepts in a fun, and innovative way without the use of computers. Yes, indeed, the majority of schools in South Africa do not have this resource. I have seen um, when I was at the Nelson Mandela University as Dean and also upon my return, the amazing work he and his team is doing. And it is my hope that this approach aimed at developing early computational thinking ability will penetrate our education system and find find its way into the curriculum of every foundation and intermediate phase teacher and reach every school in our country. <clears throat> On the program, we also have Dr. Roxanne Bailey from Northwest University. She will enlighten us and share her knowledge pertaining to strategies for teaching programming to high school learners and first year students. Mr. James Ramabu from TUT, who as part of his PhD studies developed a novel way of teaching the concept of conditional constructs to students. We will also hear from a successful teacher, Mr. Edward Fay from a township school on his approaches to teaching programming to high school learners. We also want to thank the Department of Basic Education and especially Mrs. Karina Labuskogni and her Computer Application Technology and IT Subject Committee that will also participate. We also want to welcome all lecturers attending this webinar from universities across the country, including Northwest University, the University of Western Cape, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and the University of Stellenbosch. Lecturers of different faculties of TUT, including 
the faculties of ICT, engineering and the School of Education, as well as teachers, lecturers and subject advisors from all, all over the country. You are all welcome. Lastly, I really want to thank Prof. Joey Janssen van Vieren for this important initiative and hope that common themes will emerge that will leapfrog ICT education in our country. Initiatives like these excite me and give me hope. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Over to you, Prof. Van Vieren. Thank you very much, Prof. Ben, and thank you for your time. We know you are very busy and have to leave us because you have to uh, participate in another meeting. But thank you very much for the welcome. Uh, we are now going to start. We don't want to run behind the program because we know everybody is very busy. So we will start with the first uh, 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 on the agenda, and that is the first presentation by Prof. Raymond. If you look at Prof. Raymond, I'm just going to uh, uh, read his bio for you. Is Prof. Raymond Lister retired in 2020 as an associate professor in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology at the University of Technology in Sydney. For the previous 25 years, he had both taught novice programmers and conducted research on how novice programmers learn to program. He has published over 100 papers on aspects of computing education. In 2007, he became a fellow of the Australian Learning and Teaching Council, which was one of eight such fellowships awarded that year to Australian academics across all academic disciplines. He has been program chair of International Computing Education Research Workshop, Finland's Colleague uh, uh, Calling Conference and the Australian Computer Education Conference. In 2020, the ITIC CSE Conference, which is the premier international informatics education conference in Europe, included the paper co authored by Raymond in his list of the top five papers from the entire 25 year history of that conference. ITICSE also listed the number of his papers in its list of the top five working group papers in those 25 years. Raymond was the only first author to have a paper in each of those lists. He has also been active in the sphere of high school computing education. For seven years, he was member of committees, three times as committee chair that wrote computing exams that completed by thousands of final high school students in his Australian state of New South Wales. Thank you very much, Prof, and we really appreciate your participation in our conference. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Prof Joey. If we can just arrange for some logisticals um, pertaining to our way of approaching questions that may be aimed at Prof Lister, we kindly request that everybody post their questions to the chat room. We will, as the presentation go along, categorize that questions and then we will send it at the end and during certain intervals we will allow and ask them to Prof Lister so that he can provide us with some answers um, of the questions posed. So we don't want to interrupt him while he's presenting or while any of the presenters are presenting, but everybody is welcome to make use of the chat room facility Post your questions there, we will collate them and then present it to Professor Lester when he is at the middle of a session and so forth. And then also there will be a short break in between the presentations, especially for Prof Lester as it is a long session and he's our main speaker. And in those sessions, we would like everybody that wants to to go and collect a previous introductory programming paper if you've been involved with computer programming and taught a introductory type of subject to get a paper that you have set and then use it as part of the exercise that will follow, which we will then discuss at the later stage when we go to an in detail analysis of papers after the discussion of um, Prof Lester. So that is what we're going to follow. There will be an intermediate break. We will give that all in the hands of Prof Lester when he's reached a certain point in his presentation. Towards the end of the three days, we will share the content presented um, and the slides as well as some additional 
information even for today's session later on that will assist us in determining the cognitive levels of our own type of papers. We will share a diagram and an article that will be useful in that regard. But from there onwards, um, I think we will follow as Prof. Lester indicates to us. For me, it's also an extreme privilege to welcome Prof. Lester and to thank him for his willingness to be available and teach so many of us some of his journey as a lecturer for the past 20 years. We can all learn quite a lot from him. And during the past few weeks, we had some wonderful introductory discussions and while we were meeting up with him and we learned quite a lot. And I know that everybody involved will really find it quite informative and we will all learn to become better lecturers and better assessors for that regard. And there from my side, that was just a little bit of logistics. Thanks, Prof. Van Weyck and thanks Professor Van Vieren for assisting us. And I think if it's OK, Prof. Lister, we can now hand over to you. OK, thank you, Betty. Um, um, sorry, uh, hello, Betty, everyone. I just uh, want to ask Prof, I think you can maybe uh, uh, take your camera off uh, just to share bandwidth for people that are sitting on Facebook and those places for the uh, thing. If you can just put your camera off, uh, but you can do the presentation. The uh, camera is now off. The reason I was going to turn it off, the reason for uh, having it on was just so you could see what I look like, which was not that interesting anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's customary to show that. In any event, my first slide, oh, hang on, have, have I shared the screen yet? I share um, that screen, this screen. There we go. Can you see a, a slide now that says talk one at the top? Yes. Excellent. Yes, Bruce, and you get yet another picture. That. Good. And they, and you get a, yet another picture of me there. Um, let's see. I shall start the show. Uh, so um, thank you for inviting me um, and thank you for a, a very charitable uh, introduction. Um, I hope this talk and the two talks as follow uh, live up to uh, uh, that billing. Um, so there's not much need for me to talk about my uh, background because quite a bit's just been said about it. I'll just remind you that I've taught for 25. Well, yes, I have taught for 25 years, although only about 15 of those 25 years did I teach programming. Um, when I wasn't teaching programming, I was still nevertheless uh, conducting research studies on how novices uh, learn to program. Uh, and I figured that the best way to give these three talks would be to to really lead you on the journey from where I started and then how I developed over those 25 years as both a teacher and a researcher. If I'd started with what I now know, I, I think it wouldn't connect with you. I think you, it's better if you come on the journey with me and, and, and see how I ended up where I am now. So the first talk will cover roughly my first 10 years of teaching and the beginning of my research on novice programmers. I'll just say that in my first five years, I did no no research at all. I pretty much taught in the in the manner that most people do. I sort of you know thought about what I wanted to teach. I I um, thought about nice ways to explain it. I remembered how I was taught certain things and whether that worked well or not, and and so on. Basically, I did it by the seat of my pants, as most of us do. Um, and uh, that was an interesting time. Um, Class survey seemed to show that I was doing okay with the students, but you know, I always felt um, like I was being that bone that's being torn apart there by two dogs. Um, I always thought that I was the, well, the meat in the sandwich with the expression, but in this case, the, the, the bone fought over by, by two sets of dogs. Um, on one hand, you know, my colleagues had certain expectations about what students should learn in their first semester of programming. And that's fine, that's perfectly legitimate. Um, you teach those students and those students feed through into their subjects downstream. It's entirely appropriate that your staff have expectations. But at the same time, you're fighting the reality of what the students can learn. And you know, if you teach too much and test too hard, you'll fail a lot of students. Um, and that doesn't necessarily go down well. So, I mean, you know, that reality is 
most often in some sort of debate around these kind of terms. A lot of talk about maintaining high standards and yet also talk about the failure rate. We talk a lot about maintaining standards most of the most of the year, but around about exam time and submission of grades time, uh, we focus much more on the failure rate than on the standards. So, and we, as communities go, we haven't really had a good constructive discussion worldwide, not just at your institution, a good constructive conversation about how to balance those two things. People tend to be on one side or the other in those sort of debates, and I tended to be the bone in the middle. And colleagues would often come to me and say, well, you really should teach topic X in that first semester of program because students need to know it before they arrive at my subject downstream. And that's a legitimate thing to ask for, but the, the thing that goes um, unsaid there is that every time you add a new topic to the to the uh, to the subject, uh, something else uh, must uh, the, the the coverage of some other topic uh, must be reduced. You lose the depth in some other topic. There's just a certain amount of stuff that uh, uh, can be uh, fitted in. In Australia, we have an expression, uh, the magic pudding. It's actually a, a children's story written by an Australian some years ago. And uh, the magic pudding is this pudding that you can eat from. And then when you come back to it later on, it's magically replenished itself. So it's an infinite pudding. And sometimes we add stuff to subjects uh, and add more and more topics to the subject as if the subject is a magic pudding where it just you just can keep adding things and nothing needs to ever come out. And so sometimes it felt a bit lonely. Uh, living in that sort of environment. You felt there was all these demands upon you by your colleagues and, and also the reality, what you could see the students were coping with. It was really only after about five years that I discovered that, that it just wasn't me uh, in that situation. It was other people. And that was very helpful uh, and led to a much more productive way of thinking about things. And that's kind of what I'm going to share. Before I get to that about the sharing, I, I want to start by speaking again as if I'm a um, an individual teacher teaching, and it's about the, this time of year for you. Um, I believe that many of you have just submitted grades uh, for your first semester uh, of, of teaching in various subjects, including introductory programming. So I just want to pretend for a moment that this graph here represents my performance or my students' performance uh, at the end of uh, the first semester of programming. And to be specific, uh, we're imagining, although I didn't actually do this, I'll explain shortly what this really is. Um, what we did was we put the students into a uh, a lab and said, "Here's a here." Handed we handed them a piece of paper and said, uh, "This is um, the program we want you to write in the next 90 minutes." And away they went for 90 minutes, tap tap tapping away, compiling, editing, running, and so on, trying to write a program which would do what we'd specified. At the end of the 90 minutes, we collected what the students had uh, done, and then we decided how good the solutions were. Now, uh, what you see here is the scores that we might have assigned the students from 1 to 100, and then the number of students who scored each of those, those uh, number of points. Now, if we were in a, a room together, uh, my standard practice at this point would be to pose rhetorically to you, what, do you, what would you say about this distribution? And I'd wait until somebody offered up something. I remember when I did it once, um, somebody said very, Nicely, they said, well, it's not a normal distribution. Meaning a bell curve. And somebody else in the audience then piped up with, oh, it's normal. <laughs> Meaning, oh, this is quite common. I see this sort of thing all the time, they were saying. That's one of the things we lose in these Zoom sessions. As good as it is, I mean, I couldn't talk to you otherwise at all. So it's great we've got uh, uh, Microsoft Teams and other environments to, to do these things on. But I lose that contact with the audience. Um, just to illustrate just how bad these results are, the marking scheme uh, said that if a student handed in something that compiled and something that bore some resemblance, however small, some resemblance to the program they were supposed to write, then they would score about 30 out of 100. And as you can see here, quite a few students were not scoring 30 out of 100. So just to continue that we're imagining that I've done this, I've put the students in the lab for 90 minutes and asked them to, to write a program. And this is the, the distribution of uh, marks that the students got with a lot of students down below uh, towards the bottom. Inevitably, inevitably, there would be a staff meeting about these results. And we talk about the possible reasons. 
Now, one of the reasons that uh, would not be talked about, it would be kind of there lurking in the background, but we wouldn't actually uh, say it out loud, or at least most colleagues wouldn't. And that explanation is that one. Um, yeah, there's often, that's the pressure of, of teaching by, you know, a subject like intro programming. Um, the grade distribution is often not great, and some people might think it's because you're not teaching too well. Typically, a management response is, if they inclined to believe that, um, is to change the teacher. And indeed, often I understand that management are under a lot of pressure to do things about grade distributions and so on in lots of subjects, and they need to be seen to act. And an easy and obvious thing to try is somebody else to teach. Perfectly legitimate management thing to do. So every few subjects change the lecture as often as intro programming. You know, every every few some, some bright young person goes in to teach and they think they know how to teach programming and a few semesters later their body is carried out of the lecture theater and somebody else is inserted into the room to try um also uh, this sort of uh, attitude towards the teaching uh discourages what i call truth assessment there's a lot of internal pressure then to actually effectively fudge the grade distribution by making the exam easier um, and getting a better looking distribution. But of course that has its own problems and as those students feed downstream. Another explanation is that, um, you know, Raymond is just at a lousy institution. And I quickly have to add, no, he isn't, just in case somebody from my old institutions happens to see this presentation, uh, I wouldn't want them to, to see uh, me say that, uh, just that Raymond is at a lousy institution. Of course, what we mean is, we don't mean the institution itself is lousy, what we mean is the students are lousy. All the good students go somewhere else and we're stuck with the bad ones. Yeah, that's a, that's a possible explanation. But a really bad aspect of this sort of thinking is it inhibits discussion across institutional boundaries. Um, and uh, therefore, each 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 institution is trying to solve this problem all by themselves without really talking to other institutions because they're worried that they, you know, the emperor, you know, may not have any clothes. And then if we change the programming language, the textbook, goodness knows what else, you know, we we uh, put the students into labs more often, um, or if we're already doing that, maybe maybe we're putting too much pressure on them in the labs and, the, and there's too much focus on marking stuff every week and maybe we should reduce the pressure. Basically, it boils down to change something, change something, change something without often much insight into what the, the cause of the problem is. We just have to change something to see if we can fix the problem. And it's what I, you end up doing what I called when I was doing that sort of thing, a random walk through pedagogical space. You're just trying things, but it's not clear that what you're changing will make things any better. And of course, there's evidence for what I termed the geek gene. I believe I might have coined the term geek gene. Um, uh, and uh, but it might be one of those, t you know, one of those terms that comes along and is simultaneously invented by a lot of people. Um, and it's something I don't like. I don't believe that there is an innate talent for programming, which is what I'm getting at. You know, somebody might argue, well, you know, you see these guys up here at the top here, they, they just have an innate talent and there's nothing we can do about these other people. They just lack the geek gene, the ability to program. Now, I don't like that in a university setting and I'll talk about why soon. But even worse, I know that some of you in the audience are not uh, planning to be teachers in a university environment, you're going to be teachers in a school environment. And I think that attitude is, is unacceptable in a school environment. I mean, if we're putting on a subject for a lot of students to do, for the general population of students to do, we can't say, well, you know, a lot of these students, we got, we're got we going to make a lot of students do the, the programming course, but, you know, most of them are going to fail it. I don't think that's acceptable. I think we've got to find a, uh, some sort of a programming course that allows most students to do reasonably well in it. Now that was an exam fable, as I said, for a moment to make a point, I was I was pretending that that was results for me uh, uh, in my teaching at my institution. In fact, it was, this is a graph from a paper uh, published by Mike McCracken and several other people um, back in 2001. It's customary at times like this to show a, uh, a um, you know, the, the first page of the paper. So there it is. Um, uh, what is there, 10 authors from eight different universities across five countries. Mike McCracken led the study, and so he's the, it's usually known as the McCracken Group Study. Um, back to the graph now that you've seen that. Um, 
not all of the authors of that paper collected data. They all felt that they had problems with teaching programming at their respective institutions, but data was only collected at four uh, institutions, two universities in the US and two in, in the UK. Um, but nevertheless, that's still four universities. So let's run through those explanations we, I gave earlier if we were thinking about this as something that one person had done in their in their in their one programming subject at their one university. Well, we said that you know Raymond. One explanation was that Raymond can't teach. Well, now we have to argue that uh, the people teaching all four of those institutions uh, can't teach. In fact, you know, just to back up for a second. The, although only four of the universities collected data, all of those 10 authors from eight universities in five countries participated in the study precisely because they felt they had problems with their, with their students in programming. So they all can't teach. That's a hard argument to make now when you start collating data across multiple universities in, in uh, more than one country. Um, well, I could go back and look at the list of authors again. No, I don't think they're from lousy institutions. I mean, Mike McCracken himself, the lead author, is from is from Georgia Tech, which is not just a great research university, but has very good students as well. Um, and if we changed, well, yeah, if we change something, maybe the the the, the distribution of of marks by the students would change. But consider this: um, I think all of these four institutions taught uh, C or C plus plus as their programming language at the time. Um, so in that sense, they were they had that in common, but in every other respect, their teaching was different uh, textbooks or all manner of things. And um, therefore, if you thought the change that would improve things was actually something that one of those universities was already doing, there's not, not really great um, grounds for optimism that you making that change at your institution will suddenly work when it didn't work elsewhere. Evidence for the geek gene. Mm. This was actually, although he didn't use the term geek gene, uh, this is what Mike McCracken, the, the lead author, it was his preferred explanation. As I've, Mike didn't call them, didn't talk about geek gene. Mike talked about the Picassos. He used to talk about uh, the students who did awfully well. And Mike's agenda was he was worried that if we changed how programming was done to accommodate all these students, what would happen to these Picassos, these great programmers who were going to go on and do wonderful things in the software engineering business. Well, maybe George Tech and some other elite institutions are in a position to say, well, to hell with these other students, we're going to focus on these high achieving students. I think most of us in most universities are not in a position to do that. Um, and certainly in the high school environment, I don't think we're in a position to say, well, we're just worried about, you know, we're happy that we've got identified these elite students and we're not too worried about what happens to the rest. I don't think that's acceptable. But furthermore, I think that this Picasso argument, this that, you know, that there are people with an innate talent for programming and, and that's that, or the geek gene, as I like to call it, and I mean that as a derogatory term very much. I, I make fun of people who believe that programming is a, is a, is a talent that few people have. Um, so I reject it and here's why. Before I get to the here's why, let me show you just, just closer to home. I thought I'd insert this so that you felt that this thing was a little more relevant in South Africa. This, I believe, is the distribution of marks uh, for uh, or the grades which run from L1 to L7 in your high schools in one province for the practical exam. It's not the final grade, I believe, of the students. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the practical exam uh, is one component of, of deciding the level. But nevertheless, what you see here as well, shall we say that there's an awful lot of people here who are one of Mike McCracken's uh, Picassos. They're doing very well, those students. But, you know, there's quite a lot of students, particularly these guys who are not doing very well at all down the bottom and what I assume is the bottom. Uh, have I got this? It wouldn't matter, I suppose. Have I got this around the right way that, uh, well, don't worry to answer this, but I'm assuming that L1 is the, um, is the lowest level as it would be in Australia. We don't have seven levels at high school in Australia. We have six and the Level one in Australia is the lowest level. Even if I'm mistaken about that, it's still it's still the case that a lot of people would be failing, uh, uh, and uh, and you know another set are succeeding. So the bottom line is that you know you see the same sort of thing in South Africa. Now, I believe the reason I'm going to get now to that why I think that the um, Mike McCracken's argument is wrong is uh, uh, as follows. Mike Mike argued that um, that the students who did poorly in uh, that test 
couldn't what was known as problem solve. Now, problem solving is a term that's kind of fallen a little bit out of fashion. So let me try and explain. You used to find a lot of textbooks that would start with you know, uh, programming and problem solving in Java or something like that. The term problem solving was used. And what they meant by that is, you know, you start with some sort of a description of the problem that you're meant to solve, probably in English or some natural language. And then you figure out how to do it. Well, you think, well, you know, if I'm going to solve this problem, I'm going to have to break it up and I'm going to have a little bit of code that does this and another piece of code that does that. And then you write those um, solutions um, for each of the sub problems and then you stick them together, have some glue code to, so that they're all called, the procedures are called in the right order and so on. And then you run it. And of course, the first time through, it doesn't work. So you think about why it didn't work and you just go around and around that loop. That is what the five step process in the crack and formally defined problem solving to be. Now, I wish that was the problem my students had. I, I really wish that was. Um, I think my students had worse problems than that. Or to put it another way, to, to express this as a researcher, is this the simplest explanation for why the students can't do it? I mean, to be facetious for a moment, you know, it started with abstract problem from the description. What if the description was written in, in, in a language that the students couldn't read? Uh, then clearly that's why they did badly. They couldn't even read the description. That's a little facetious, but my point is that it's not necessarily Occam's razor. It's not, we're not look necessarily nominating the simplest explanation uh, when we say the students can't problem solve. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that that's, that the problem is worse than that. And to, generate, to demonstrate that in 2004, um, I led a group uh, which became known as the Leeds group because we met in, in Leeds, the United Kingdom to sort of put our heads together and write the paper. There were 12 of us. Um, all of us from a different university across seven countries and together we compiled data from 500 students and an interesting aspect of our study un unlike the McCracken study was that to be part of this study you had to collect data for your students so all 12 of us brought data from our 12 different universities give us a big mix of students from across the world 12 universities in seven countries and before I go further I'm not sure I need to explain this anymore but the word tracing um, uh, used to be a relatively obscure term. Back in 2004, when we wrote this paper, it was. Back then, tracing was a word that only Americans used to describe the practice of, well, I'll show you in a second what tracing is. Um, since then, it's become a relatively well-known international term, but I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page. Since I don't know what terms are used in South Africa, I thought I'd highlight that word tracing. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of a tracing problem. What we do is we give the students some code. Don't bother reading that code. It's just there as a bit of visual candy. We've got some code and we initialize some variables and then we pose a problem to the, a question to the student like what value is in variable I after this code is executed. So what we're looking and this is a paper based exam. So what we're looking uh, it for is a student to sit down and play human computer. Uh, in Australia, we often call this desk checking. Um, I once called it um, manual execution and actually somebody in the audience thought I meant chopping off the hands of students uh, when I said that. So I stopped using that term. Um, so and you can see this student has done exactly that. They've um, written all over this exam paper as they've uh, tried to figure out what the answer is and they've circled option C, which I believe is actually the correct answer uh, for memory. Um, and we asked 12 multiple choice questions of the 12 multiple choice questions. Seven were like this. Seven were tracing questions. And as you can see, in this case, no real code writing school required. You just got to manually execute the code. So no problem solving, no code writing skill of any sort, let alone problem solving. No abstracting from the description, no dividing the sub problems, no, you know, et cetera. The other sort of, the other sort of um, question we had, and there was five of these in our 12 questions, was what for now I'll call the missing code questions. So the purpose of the following code is to move, is to move uh, elements of array S one place to the left, and I, and I actually, I must admit, I banged this code out really fast. I'm not sure that I got it right, but trust me, even if there's a bug there, um, uh, just pretend that uh, it, it, it would, um, it is valid code for moving elements in the array one place to the left. Let's not worry about what happens on, on the ends of the array. That's just too complicated for right now. And then the question becomes the correct code that should replace these X's here is and I give the we gave the students four options and they had to choose the right one. And one way they could solve this problem is just to plug, you know, plug in option A and then sort of trace the code, manually execute it to see if that gave, you know, did did what they were hoping. 
And if it didn't, and it doesn't, by the way, I think the correct option is B. Um, uh, they, you know, we plug that one in, eventually they'd find the right answer. So again, um, even though there's code missing, there's no real code writing experience required, especially as we give them four options and they could in theory trace the code to, to figure out which of the four options. So let's do a little bit of maths now. If you knew nothing about programming and all you could do was guess these tracing problems and missing code, code problems, what's the probability of correctly guessing one multiple choice question. So what's the probability of guessing this one question? If we're in the if we were all in the one room right now, I would stop until I tease that answer out from one of you. Uh, as we're not in the one room, I'll just carry on and say, well, it's there are four options, so the chances are one in four. And there are 12 multiple choice questions. So what's the most likely score if you guessed all 12 questions? Well, one quarter times 12, which is three. So remember that number three. That's going to be relevant on the next slide. Now, so we collected data in the Leeds group from tw at 12 universities in seven countries, over 500 students to compile this little table at the end of their first semester of programming. Before I go any further, I'll just clarify one thing. I know this causes problems sometimes. Um, we used 12 multiple choice questions that also happened to be 12 universities to study. And sometimes people get a bit confused about those two occurrences of the number 12. The number of universities is not that important. Just focus on the fact that there are 12 multiple choice questions. So if a quarter of our students scored 10, 11, or 12 out of 12 on those on those multiple choice questions, and that's pretty good. 10 out of 12 is pretty good because tracing is an error prone activity. You could easily get those questions wrong. So 10 out of 12 is pretty good. I'm a little less excited about the second quartile. Um, eight out of 12, I mean, that's uh, two thirds of the questions, isn't it? So for every three questions, the students were getting one wrong. Okay, the performance is not bad, but you know, this, their, their skills are a little bit flaky. This, um, but let's not worry about them too much compared with the rest of the students. The third quartile of students scored five to six or seven out of 12. So they were getting every second question wrong. Remember, we're talking about questions where students trace code, you know, questions of where the students trace code, like that. Seven of those questions, and then seven questions where they had to figure out what the missing line was when they were given the correct line and three distractors. So I'm thinking that students who get scored are getting every second question of that type wrong have very poor skills that will not help them to write code. You know, if they can't, if they write a piece of their own code, how are they going to debug it? If they can't reliably trace that code, their own code, how can they debug their own code? But let's not even worry too much about these guys in the third quartile. In the bottom quartile, the bottom quartile scored between zero and four. And you remember that number from the previous slide, three? If you simply guessed uh, the uh, the 12 multiple choice questions, the most likely score you'd get is three. You might do a little bit better. You might get four or even five. You might be lucky. You might be unlucky and get, say, zero, as some of them did. Um, but, you know, basically 25% of these students were performing at a level consistent with chance. Not on a big problem solving pro program writing uh, activity, but on questions like this where they had to trace the code and questions like this where they had to figure out what the missing line was. 25% of our students at 12 universities in seven countries, 25% of them were operating at a level consistent with chance. So my first suggestion to you is, I, I know some of you have just finished grading uh, uh, exams for first semester. Um, firstly, you should take a lot of comfort from this, I think. I hope you, I hope you will. And furthermore, I think maybe you should take this, this um, this uh, table and stick it on the wall above your desk. And so that in moments of despair, you can look up and say to yourself, it's not just me. It's <laughs> it's not me. I'm not a bad teacher. I'm not at a lousy institution. These are worldwide problems. Lots of students have lots of problems with very basic skills involved in programming. But to get back to Mike's study and Mike's thesis that there are just students who are very gifted and, and other students who just simply cannot problem solve. You know, they cannot design code, they can't break it down into modules, they can't put the modules together and then debug their own code. Problem solving. 
Well, if you showed me a student who did very well, 10, 11 or 12 on our study, and then I, sh uh, 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 but that student did very poorly on uh, in the in the McCracken study, uh, then I would say, okay, I can't I can't prove that the student has a uh, doesn't have a problem solving problem. Uh, maybe they do. Maybe they do have basic skills, and their problem is that they can't problem solve. But don't tell me that about the bottom quartile. But, you know, to get back to what you know, I said earlier, backing up. I said, uh, McCracken said the students can't problem solve, you know, this sort of a process. And I said, Occam's razor, you know, is that the simplest explanation? Well, I, it's possible that it is the simplest explanation. Possible, I don't think it is, but possible for these guys. But don't tell me it's the simplest explanation for these guys. These guys, their problem is not problem solving. They haven't got to that problem yet. These guys in the bottom quartile lack very basic skills. Uh, they are well away from having a problem solving problem. Okay. So I hope you're encouraged by that. Uh, if you have taught programming lately and, and, and the results cause you some despair, it's not just you, you are not alone. These are worldwide problems. Furthermore, I just want to make the point, it wasn't like one institution dragged our results down. We saw these sort of um, results fairly consistently across universities. Now, let me show you. So just a reminder, we did at 12 universities across seven countries and 500 students. Now, this is a graph of how the, the 500 students as a, as a whole performed on the test. So multiple choice question one, multiple choice question two, all the way up to multiple choice question number 12. And on the left hand side, you see the percentage of um, students who got the answer correct. So on the first four problems here, uh, the students, all students on questions one to four scored between, well, the students as a whole, 60 to 70 percent of them, say two out of three students answered the first four questions correctly. Now, the reason for these big uh, metal lines, uh, big uh, black lines in this arrow is I want you to focus on in, in here. We've got this sort of W shape. So students did quite well on question five and then much more poorly on question six. They did much better on question seven, but uh, but then again, much more poorly on question eight and, then, and so on. So we've got this W. Now what I'm gonna do is show you a graph where we don't have one line like this, but we show you the lines for uh, most of the institutions. Uh, there's not 12 lines here because this is only showing lines for, for institutions that um, offered up quite a lot of data. And although students do better at some institutions than others, like this, this, this diamond hit shape here, these students can, this institution does consistently better than say the, the, the triangle, these students from the, the triangular uh, line. But even so, it's still the case that students at this institution do better on this question than on that question. And equally students on this, um, from this institution do better on this question than on that question. So there's some sort of regularity across the institutions. Um, and as I like to say, you know, you may not be teaching at MIT, and, you, and in fact, for that matter, you might, you may think that, well, let's put it this way. Let's say that UTS students, where I used to teach, are certainly not the quality of MIT students. Um, but we shouldn't simply say, oh, hang on, oh, we don't want to do that. We simply shouldn't say, well, MIT students do better, say 90% than UTS students, and there's no comparison otherwise between the students. You can compare across institutions because what you should always be comparing is pairs of questions, relative performance. And what we see here, spent a lot of time getting that animation to work, so I hope you enjoyed that. Let's put it back up there. No idea how long it took me to get this thing to move down. Go on, move. Wow. Um, so <laughs> that was just to wake you up if you're starting to fall asleep. Um, what you should always be doing is is comparing. If you are comparing across institutions, it's not how much better one institution did another. It's these sort of regularities. Do students do better on one question than they do on another? And then you can have a productive conversation across institutional boundaries about what the problems are. Forgetting institutional boundaries for a second and just worrying about your own institution, even in your own institution, focus on pairs of questions or if you like, you know, students did better on this question than they did on that question. So why? You know, they obviously know something about programming because they did OK on this question and quite a few others, but then they did poorly on this question. Why? That's a much more productive discussion to have. 
Um, it reduces um, all the negative kind of ex uh, discussions you can have. Raymond can't teach. Well, ra perhaps Raymond can't teach, but he certainly taught them something here. So what was going wrong down here? Even if we believe it was a problem with Raymond's teaching, we, we're having a good discussion now about what worked here but wasn't working here. And the moral decay of Western civilization, what I'm getting at there is, you know, the regular discussion that kids today just cannot, you know, they just don't have, their brains have been ruined. Today, I, it's probably mobile phones that are ruining their, their brains. When I was at, uh, when I was an undergraduate, you know, uh, I think it was television was ruining our brains. Uh, and I believe before that, it, uh, the, an, a generation before mine, it was the radio was ruining their brains because they weren't reading enough and so on. Um, you get away from the moral decay of Western civilization arguments when you start comparing pair, you know, relative performance on different questions. You say, well, you know, they're not doing well here, but, you know, Western civilization is not falling apart. They did OK on this question. So, you know, why is it that they're not doing so well on that question? That's almost a digression, I suppose, this last couple of slides, but it's an important digression. I hope you keep that in mind when you start analysing your papers. It's really good to compare performance across questions. You can even do things like say, well, let, let's take out of the sample everybody who got this question wrong. Let's just look at all the students who got this question right. How did they go on this question? You know, we know they can do this. What are they doing wrong on this other question? Then you can have productive discussions about your exam paper. To get a little bit back, back more onto the main topic, um, um, so I don't doubt that McCracken was right to some extent. I'm sure that some students have a problem with problem solving. They have difficulty with writing and designing their own code, but there are other problems people have in, with learning to program that which which precede this. They don't even get to this problem, and I think that we fairly established pretty well in the in the the 2004 Leeds group, that one of the basic skills that students need and many don't have uh, is an ability to trace a piece of code. So, right, so then I think that begs the question, um, well, what else are the students missing? You know, are there other skills? You know, are there, are there students who can trace code, but they, they're, they're missing some other skills uh, that they need before they can truly write code? Good question if you were thinking it, and um, we will take that up with much more vigour tomorrow in talk two. Um, all right, so there's an ad for tomorrow's talk, but I do want to focus on this tracing issue um, and a few issues like it in the rest of this talk. OK, this is the end of part one. It's not the end of talk one, but it's the end of part one of the talk. And um, I think the first, the summary is you are not alone. As I said, if, if you are in despair at how your students are going, I suggest you cut out this little table here and you stick it uh, on the wall above your desk and just every now and then look at it and say, it's not me, it's not me. These are very common problems. But there is a downside to that, which is um, lots of people have that problem that students are doing very poorly and lots of people have tried all sorts of things. So. If, they, if somebody's tried something elsewhere and it hasn't worked, there's not a lot of grounds to, for optimism that it will work when you do it at your institution. Um, I think the biggest problem is I talked earlier about a random walk in pedagogical space. I think we're all trying things and a lot of the time we're trying the same things as other people are trying. Um, and our changes are not bold enough. If we really want to have good, good improvement on learning outcomes, then we need to be more bold and get away from the obvious things that people have tried all around the world, changing programming languages. You know, it's a it's a 20 year cycle roughly, isn't it, of changing the programming language. Uh, right now, Python is on the ascendancy because Java is not a great language for whatever reason. So people say, I don't agree with that, but so people say that so Python's on the ascendancy. I remember when Java was on the ascendancy because C++ was a lousy language. And before that, Pascal was going to save, a, you know, be the language that would save us. And, and before that, you know, and, and well, anyway, so you get the point. And, and other things besides um, changing the language, all sorts of teaching tricks uh, have been tried. And I don't think we're trying bold enough changes in general because most of the obvious things have been tried in other places. So that brings me to part two, and it brings me to Bloom's taxonomy, um, which I know the the organisers are very keen for me to talk about um, today because I believe, I'm not sure, don't know the details, but I believe that there's been quite a lot of discussion in your environment about Bloom's taxonomy. Sorry, Raymond. Yes, Bertie. 
Yes. Um, maybe this is now a good time. If there is people that have a question, we didn't yeah. have any typed questions or just a comment. Maybe they could um, unmute themselves and um, they can then maybe just ask if there is. Otherwise, if there's no questions or comments, then we you, you can continue. But I just think that this is a wonderful one. I ask people to email me questions or to post questions on the chat. So far, nobody has, but maybe somebody will have the courage to post something or to ask something if they want to. For me, I think to have that printed out and placed against your wall as some encouragement for many lecturers and for many uh, teachers out there is something to take note of. And it's I'm so thankful that you said it. So is there anybody with a question or a comment? Maybe if you want to post it, you can post it. Or if you want to ask it in person, you can unmute and ask. Otherwise, if not, then Prof. Lester can continue. You can uh, just write your Sorry, but I already opened it that everybody can post the questions. I think it will be better if we rather post the questions because then we also have got it later on uh, what type of questions we uh, we had. So we prefer that they post it on the chat. Okay, that's all fine. Thanks, Prof. Lester, then you can continue. Thanks. Uh, no problem, Bertie. I think that was a good intervention. Um... Uh, can I just ask, uh, the, there is a question that somebody asked, what is the, uh, did you do research on what is the best language to teach first year students? I don't, I don't do research in that area. Um, all I can, and since I haven't done any research in that area, I, I cannot offer a, an answer to that question with the authority of a researcher. But let me bore you with my own um, opinion on that. I mean, and, and let's, Let's be clear about this. My opinion is no more privileged than anybody else's on this. I don't think programming language matters, really. I mean, it's not our biggest problem. Um, when you've seen, I've taught, I don't know how many languages I've taught in, um, three or four introductory programming. And um, there are certain advantages to certain languages, um, but it's all swings and roundabouts. Um, I mean, there are some languages you definitely shouldn't teach. I mean, obviously, my first language, Fortran, is something you shouldn't teach anymore. Um, I'd be more inclined to le to stay away from C++ because uh, it's, it, it's nasty things happen in C++. Uh, if you want to teach those sort of broadly object-oriented concepts, then Java is an improvement on C++ in my view. So there are some little... Um, uh, changes like that, that you know, some improvements in some, but in broadly speaking, as long as a language is reasonable, um, uh, they're all they're all equally ineffective in a way as the first language. Students will struggle on all of them. They will struggle on different things because different languages have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, a lot of the a lot of the sort of literature at the moment is saying what a great language Python is, and Python does have a number of good things about it. And one that's often brought up is that students can practically write code straight away. They don't need all that boilerplate code, uh, that those lines that, you know, public static void main and so on as you do in Java and so on. And that is, a, that is an advantage. Uh, but I think it catches up with you later on in other ways. So my, my own opinion, and I stress it's not a privileged position as a researcher, is that it doesn't really matter. Uh, apart from some extreme languages, which would just happen, uh, no one in their right mind probably would want to teach. Uh, all languages are the same. I think the real reason to, to uh, a powerful reason for choosing a language is how it fits into your entire degree program. Um, just before I retired, they were having starting to have that discussion at uh, UTS where we'd been teaching Java for a number of years, and that worked well for us because we used Java then through many subjects throughout the entire degree because our emphasis in those days was on software engineering. So an early introduction to Java was was very effective, but uh, the department was changing um, to being more of a department with a, an, uh, uh, an emphasis on data science, at the very least an equal emphasis on data science is on, um, is on software engineering. And the data science people were saying, well, look, you know, Python is the language for, for data science, and we would like you to teach that instead. Um, so my answer is there is no best language for teaching the first semester in isolation, but I think you should be thinking about your whole of degree. Uh, that's the best thing you can do. 
so I didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, because. Right. So back to Bloom's taxonomy. Is that right? If I, I'll just assume unless nobody interrupts me right now, I just assume that we, we shall carry on. I think that was probably a good point for, for a little break anyway. Right. Bloom's taxonomy. Ah, now before we get to actually talking about the taxonomy, let me give you a hint as to as to my interest in Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, and this was something I was working on roughly from about 19, 1999 through till 2002, 2003, quite a lot of work uh, during that time. Um, Mike talked about his Picassos. And let's look at some of these other students on this graph. I mean, there's a jump down from, from the Picasso, Mike, Mike McCracken's Picassos to these guys. And I thought they deserved a name too, all these students down here. They, they you know, these guys, if these are the Picassos, what are these guys? And I came up with, just for a bit of amusement, I called them the watercolorists. These are the people who get out on the weekend and, you know, paint landscapes uh, in watercolors. And they might be very good at it too, but they're, they're not Picassos. And then, of course, there's this bunch down here who are doing terribly on, on Mike's um, test. And I thought long and hard about what name to give them. And I eventually decided that I'd call them. Um, you might think I'm making fun of them. In some sense, I am. But I'm doing it as, look, if you teach first, first semester introductory programming, you've got to have a sense of humour. Um, honestly, you'll go mad if you don't have a sense of humour. I'm not really making fun of the students. I'm I'm just giving them a name uh, for for shorthand. Um, although I do say that if you watch these people attempt to write programs, they can't. But if you watch them, at, at, you know, you sit beside them and watch them trying to type some code in and get it working on the machine. I say to people, if you watch them for an hour or so, but at the end of that hour, you'll see that there's more code on their face than there is in the computer. Um, it's a mess, those students, when they attempt to write stuff. It's a mess. I apologize if anybody's uh, offended by my, they feel I'm being very derogatory towards these students. I'm just had, trying to have a bit of fun. I'm sorry. Okay, so the bottom line though is actually, it's three categories of students, irrespective of what we call them. Um, and um, what I started to think about because of Bloom's taxonomy was, well, I think those students form three quite qualitatively different. It's not like, the Picassos just know a bit more than the watercolorists who know a bit more than the, the other guys. Um, they are qualitatively different students given their stage of development. Maybe some of those finger painters will go on to become Picassos, but currently in their current state of learning, um, if I gave them and do anything with it. So it's a futile learning activity and a futile assessment activity for those students in that bottom category. So in general, what I'm what I'm hitting at is that um, um, I want to devise qualitatively different learning and assessment activities for each of these three broad categories of, of students. Rather than giving them all the one task and then giving these students a, a high you know, percentage score, a medium percentage score and a low percentage score, I don't think that helps the students. Uh, I, certainly from a point of view of learning, these guys in their struggles are learning nothing. Uh, from a large open-ended task. These guys probably aren't learning much either because they just know it already. These guys are probably benefiting from some relatively well-constructed assignment, but these guys in particular are not getting any benefit about being asked to write code for a non-trivial problem. I mean, they can't trace code. They can't nominate the single line that's missing in a, in a small piece of code. If they can't do those things, how are they going to learn to program by trying to do some big open-ended problem? So I'm looking for qualitatively different tasks that help each of their students. And maybe with time, having when they're presented with something that uh, helps them to learn, these students will progress eventually to becoming Picassos. But at the moment, they, they will never get there if, if they're not given something that's more appropriate for their stage of development. And that's where the Bloom's taxonomy comes in. Um, I believe some of you, well, I, I know that uh, the reason why I put 54, 56 is because sometimes Bloom's taxonomy is referred to as 954 because that's when the committee met to to uh, produce Bloom's taxonomy. 1956 is when the actual book of Bloom's taxonomy came out. So you see this confusion about the dates. Um, and I've given, just bear with me for a moment. I know that some of you are accustomed to the revised taxonomy. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, this is the old original Bloom's taxonomy from the 1950s, six levels, um, and a student can only manifest, you know, can solve a problem at these high levels if they can generally solve problems at lower levels of the taxonomy. 
Now, I've got this little triangle. I'm going to stop it for a second because I wasn't originally intending to do this, but I'm going to blow it up a bit because um, this is the original um, taxonomy, knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Now, I believe that many of you who are listening to this talk uh, are do working with Bloom, but you're working with what's called the revised taxonomy from 2001. Uh, and there are some changes. Some of the changes are very simple. They change the name of some levels from knowledge is now remember. Comprehension is simply understand. Same thing, uh, but just different names. The ones in the middle have been changed from nouns, application and analysis to verbs, apply and analyze. And the biggest, the most substantive change is that uh, the synthesis and evaluation levels uh, from the original taxonomy um, have been reversed so that uh, evaluate is now the second and synthesis is now called create. Now, I'm going to say to you that I'm sorry if I, I hope that my use of the old words doesn't cause you too much um, a confusion. Um, I learned Bloom's taxonomy before the revision came out and I've never felt a deep need to use the revision. So I'm afraid I'm just a stick in the mud who's working with the old one. And I hope that doesn't cause too much confusion for you. Um, as I go. Oh, with regard to that change in the um, with regard to that change in the swap in the swapping of these two levels, let me make this point now. I don't regard that as a terribly big thing to worry about because it turns out if you read the original uh, book by Bloom and, and co-authors, the, these well, I think I've got it on the next slide anyway. Yeah. The six levels of the taxonomy are meant to be thought of as three pairs. Um, uh, and I think, well, it's uh, very simple problems, and I'm going to show you a few in a moment. Um, then application and analysis problems are still fairly small, but they're non-trivial at least, and I'll call that highly structured. That's very vague. I'll show you some examples of that shortly. And then finally, uh, evaluation synthesis levels are dealing with large, in our case, programs. and and uh, exercises that allow the student to express some creativity. So there's not a single correct solution. There's lots of things students could do. But as I said, in Bloom's tax, the original taxonomy, the the six levels are meant to form pairs, um, and it's not too. Bloom is not too fussed about whether, you know, it's really that if you can do one of these, you're you're also doing the other or learning how to do the other at the same time. So there's, it's almost like the taxonomy should be drawn with comprehension and knowledge on one line and analysis and application on one line. They, so the, the swapping in the revised taxonomy of the upper two levels, to my mind, is not, is not a big deal. OK. If you have trouble remembering the names, just keep remembering three pairs, low, middle and high. We'll be right with that. And you might see where I'm heading. Um, I'm just giving a little preview. I'm going to talk more about this. What I'm going to do is, you don't really know what these are yet, but I'm going to go through those in a second. But as a little preview of where we're heading, the Picassos should be given large and relatively you know, creative learning exercises and assessment exercises. The watercolorists can handle you know, non-trivial but highly structured problems. And the finger painters, you can only really expect them if you want to give them a pass. And if there's 25 to 30 to 40 percent of the students are finger painters and you have to pass a fair percentage of those then you've got to be giving them relatively simple tasks that's a preview don't worry too much if there's too much information there what i'm going to do now is go through bloom's taxonomy um, step by step and give you my little potted uh, explanation of it um, and the quotes i'm going to use from you are not from the original book from 1956 um, uh, it's from a, another book that appeared in 1994, um, uh, edited by Lauren Anderson and one of the uh, and Lauren Sosniak, and it was published 40 years after the original taxonomy. And it was you know a bunch of people wrote papers about what they thought about the taxonomy uh, in this book. And one useful thing about this book is that chapter two uh, is a series of well there it is excerpts from the taxonomy of educational objectives. So it's a series of excerpts from the original book. They went through and they picked out what they thought were the most salient points from the original book, and, and it's one chapter of this book. And it turns out then that, oh, by the way, while we, um, 
No, it turns out that they, they summarize the six levels in eight pages, and I think it's a good eight pages. I've already sent those eight pages to the organizers, and I'm hoping that maybe they'll be able to get those eight pages, a scan of those eight pages out to all of you, because I highly recommend that you read those eight pages if you're going to use Bloom's Taxonomy. The trouble with most people's use of Bloom's Taxonomy is that they, they're aware of the names of the levels. These are the old ones, you know, some of the new ones. And the trouble is that these all words all come with um, baggage from your um, normal lives, your pre-Bloom lives. So you attach to these words meanings that are not intended by Bloom. For example, people often say, well, look, if a student can comprehend something, then they can apply it. So therefore, what's the difference? Well, I'll show you shortly what the difference in Bloom is between comprehension and application. So you need to get past just the names and you need to do a little bit of reading, say these eight pages. I like to quote something that they write on the first page of chapter two. Uh, I know some of you are, are listening to this talk on a small screen. So let me, um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna blow up that little bit that I've underlined. There is just blown up here. Benjamin Blue himself used to say that the book, it was one of the most widely cited yet least read books in American education. And that's my point. I mean, people talk about Bloom without having read much about it. And uh, I think that causes a lot of confusion. Uh, it's best if you could at least read these eight pages. Right, so let's read some of these pages. So in the document I've sent around, um, and hopefully you will be able to get, um, on what is page 18 of the, of the book, page 18, which is in chapter two of the excerpts, um, you'll find a heading that says knowledge. And you'll, my apologies to people who don't like to see people uh, underline and, and annotate books. I've, as you can see, when I was reading this, I did quite a lot of annotating, drawing, and even big thick lines like this. So if you're offended by that, my apologies to you. Um, but what you'll find is that these are the little sections that I find to be the best reads. Um, they were the best reads for me anyway, and, and I'm going to highlight them to you. Now, I, again, I know many of you are watching this on small screens and can't read that. What I'm going to do is, I'm when every time there's something that from these underlining that I think is particularly important, I'm just going to blow it up like this so you can see it. Um, hopefully you can see it. So knowledge is kind of what you thought it would mean. Um, what was it in the other one? Remembering in the revised taxonomy, remembering. And there you go. Remembering is the major psychological process. Um, and crucially, the recall situation is very similar to the original learning situation. So it's, you know, what are the three types of rocks? Sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic, are they? Something like it's just, you know, things that you know. Bits of knowledge that you know. Um, very basic, and since many of you are computer science, you can think of the knowledge level as the base case in recursion. This is, <laughs> we have to start somewhere, and this is at the lowest level. And here maybe this, I took this out of the exam from um, our host university. This is out of one of your recent exam papers, I think 2020. Uh, 2020 spring, maybe. I don't know what the S means, I'm guessing. Here's a question. What is a static method? Blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm going to guess that it's A, a method that belongs to a class. Method belongs to an instant, not that one. I don't know. Well, that's a, a distractor. Uh, no, they're not. Well, they are accessible to, uh, hmm, they are accessible through an instance, but I'm going to go with that one. A method that belongs to a class. Maybe I'm just playing my ignorance at this point, but. Um, Please forgive me if I am, but the major point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, it's straight knowledge. So that's, that's yeah, almost rote learning. Uh, we don't we don't condone rote learning, but in theory, some aspects at least of knowledge, the knowledge level could be rote learned. Um, now, turning the page to page 19 and comprehension. What was it called in the recall one? Um, understanding, wasn't it? Um, in, in the revised one. Maybe I should bring this along with me. To, oops, what did I just do? Oh, I did that, didn't I? Let's see if I just bring that along with me. Um, so here we are now in comprehension. I'll paste this in. I'll have to blow it up briefly to see what it says. Yes, understand, understand. Um, so in the old one, it's comprehension. In the new one, it's understand. Um, 
Now, and again, I have uh, highlighted some stuff that I recommend that you read in, in the document that I've circulated. The highlighting is is present. I recommend those little bits. I recommend you read the whole thing, but pay some attention to those highlighted bits. So um, the student demonstrates an understanding of the literal message contained in the communication. Um, and that doesn't mean much, I, I confess, an understanding of the literal message contained in the communication. Um, Bloom himself gave an example of uh, what he meant by that. Um, uh, he went to a school one day and he said to something like, um, uh, if you're at the center of the earth, what would the rocks be like? And the students looked at him dumbfounded and the teacher said, oh, Professor Bloom, you're asking the wrong question. You know, um, what's the type of rock at the center of the earth? Uh, maybe I'm getting the, the actual exercise wrong, but what's the type of rock? And the students to a, to a student shouted out igneous. Um, so they knew the word igneous. That was knowledge. You know, that was the knowledge level. Um, but what Benjamin Bloom was asking was a question where he was looking to see if they understood what they meant by igneous. Um, uh, so that's what comprehension is. It's a, it's a demo by by and the key word that I pick out of that section is the word translation. By translating in some sense from the actual question asked, you demonstrate your understanding of the material by providing a not a rote answer, but an answer that indicates by translation uh, into uh, you you demonstrate your understanding. So, for, oh, and crucially, although this is not obvious at this point in the in the book in the in the excerpts. Uh, a comprehension level question provides all necessary information uh, to answer the question. There's no gaps left, uh, the things that the student needs to infer. What I mean by that might be a little bit more clear when we get to application, so just bear that in mind for the moment. So translation, well, let me give you some examples then of what uh, a comprehension level and what an understanding level uh, question is. Simple rule, all code tracing exercises are comprehension. If I give students a piece of code and say what values in a particular variable when it's executed, uh, they are always comprehension. The student has demonstrated their understanding of this code, their comprehension of this code, by telling me you know, what values in a variable when it finishes. Comprehension. All code training exercises are comprehension. Translate. I've used the word translate in this question you know, to emphasize what I said on the Two slides back. Translate the following pseudocode to code. So for loop header where i runs from one to ten, print out the value in i, move the cursor to a new line. Okay. Um, I, I'm trying to avoid blanket statements like translating is always comprehension. That's why you'll see often here um, because there are grey areas. Um, this I'm going to argue is a comprehension question because well all the necessary information is provided and your job is to translate that from that pseudocode into proper say Java. Now you might say but hang on uh, you said all necessary information is provided but you know you haven't told them that the a for loop um, has three parts to it the initialization the test condition and the and the, the changing bit the updating bit. Um, well that's true but I expect them to know that because that's just basic knowledge. That's something that I can assume, basic knowledge. Um, but here's the key one that I think you need to to, to uh, understand. To be at the comprehension level, um, the, 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 the translation from pseudocode to code needs to be such that one line of pseudocode translates to one line of re real code, as it does there. Uh, you're not leaving any gaps that the um, student needs to infer need to be filled in with more code. Right, and then we can translate not just from pseudocode, we can translate from other things from like, like this, this flow chart into, into a piece of code. So that would be an if statement. Um, often compression, oh, comprehension, often understanding, provided the mapping from flow chart to code is straightforward. Now I put straightforward in, um, in inverted commas because it's a bit hard to pithily define what I mean by, you know, uh, uh, a reasonable mapping. It was easy for pseudocode, I just said, commonly a one-to-one -one relationship between pseudo code and, and real code. Um, well, there is no way of defining a um, real code in terms of a one-to-one -one mapping uh, from a flow chart, so I can't use a term like that, but I'm just going to have to leave that a little bit vague and say to you that the focus is on demonstrating understanding of the code and flow charts. And what I mean is 
this is definitely comprehension, but if you gave the students a much more complicated flow chart that's filled the whole page, say, and the student would have to figure out that some of the bits of the flow chart would be nested ifs inside something else and some parts would be loops and what have you. So it's not just uh, not just their understanding of the, the the flow chart and their and their understanding of code. It's really it requires a real mental effort to disentangle the flow chart into a nice nested piece of code. That's not comprehension. It needs to be quite straightforward. Right, the purpose of the following code is to move array S elements one place to the left. Ah, well, this is the this is the example I showed you earlier, isn't it? I think it is. Um, uh, so uh, the quick the correct replacement is. So this is once again, you know, picking out the the one missing line and inserting it like that is a comprehension level. I mean, as I said before, this in this in theory could be done by tracing. You could plug in option A and trace it to decide if that works it doesn't I think the correct option is B and then when you plug that one in you'd see that it does work you could just do a little trace um, so that's comprehension usually a single missing line uh, if there's more missing lines it's not that they suddenly stop being comprehension it's just that I want to avoid um, gray areas obviously you know if you start with the you know if you're missing one line of code I'm going to say it's comprehension if I, so if two lines of code are missing, is it still comprehension? Well, maybe. Well, if it's three lines of code, is it still comprehension? Well, it could be. If 10 lines are missing, is it is it comprehension? Probably not, but I can't be sure. Um, so I want to keep this simple. I want to avoid gray areas, at least for this introduction. And I'm just going to say, usually it'll be one line of code that's missing. Um, you can try for more. That doesn't stop it being comprehension. But, you know, if you start down that path, uh, that is the path to the dark side and forever you will be lost. Um, so keep it small. Um, one line missing. Definitely multiple choice, not free response. It has to, to be comprehension. It has to be um, a, a multiple choice question because you must provide the solution effectively to the student along with distractors. You must provide all necessary information for it to be comprehension. The student is effectively demonstrating their, their understanding of the correct line. It. Could be done by tracing, as I've already said. Usually a previously seen algorithm or a very simple variation. This troubles me, just like I was saying, usually a single missing line here, but you know, maybe two is, maybe three is also common, maybe 10 is, but you know, I'm not, you know, this is gray area and it gets murky very quickly. Same thing here. I mean, what is a simple variation on an algorithm? Now, this code is moving everything one place to the left. I'm very comfortable with the idea that uh, if we provided the student with code that moved everything one place to the right instead of the left, that also would be a, you know, uh, uh, a comprehension level question. So maybe they saw this code moving things one place left during semester, but then in the exam, what they'd never seen before was code that moved everything the other direction, one place to the right. That would be okay, but I wouldn't agree that, say, writing a piece of code that reversed um, the order of elements in the array was a simple variation. Uh, and so you get you, you start going down the dark path again um, and you'll end up, you know, heavy breathing and you'll be like Darth Vader if you start to try and figure out what uh, simple variations are. I recommend really that play safe at least for the time being um, and be very, very careful if not totally abstain from simple variations. And that's going to worry you. You're going to start thinking, well, Raymond's advocating that all the, yeah, all the code that we give for these comprehension activities um, is code they've already seen during semester. Um, well, I'll just write learn it. They won't truly understand the code. They'll just, you know, they'll just write learn it. Well, give them enough code. That is, give them enough, you know, a sufficiently large code base during semester so that they can't learn it. They can't learn it all uh, by rote learning. Um, and there's your problem solved. And uh, in general, this is a digression, I suppose. In general, in programming, we don't give students enough examples uh, of code. Uh, we tend to say, you know, he, this is how a for loop works. Here's one example, here's two. Now go away and write some code that uses for loops. Um, no, students tend not to learn from one or two examples. Students need many examples. And that's one virtue of what I'm advocating here. Give them a large enough code base so that they really can't rote learn the, the answers come exam time. And the nice side effect of that is uh, that they've, they've now been exposed to lots and lots of examples. Some students learn from examples. They don't learn from 
one or two examples plus a general principle. OK, now if you think these are too easy, particularly, you know, like, you know, what's the single missing line? You think, oh, I don't want to give that to my students. That's too easy. Um, so just remember that these are the sort of problems that we gave them in the in that mobile in that Leeds working group study. We asked them, we gave them, you know, nominate a single missing line or trace some code and 25% of our students were operating at a level consistent with chance. So these are not simple problems. These are not trivial problems that all the students will get right. A lot of students will get these problems wrong. OK, I spent a long time on comprehension, but that's OK because comprehension is such an important uh, level to be talking about um, when teaching programming. We don't spend enough time. Um, I just want to remind you what the levels are uh, just before we to move into before we start talking about applications. So we think of them as three pairs and think of the middle ones now as non-trivial but highly structured. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, while while we're here and looking at this, uh, this is I mean, I just said a moment ago, comprehension is such an important area when we're teaching students to program. Here in a nutshell is why I think we have such a problem with getting getting students to learn to program. Really, so many of the activities we give them that whether they're learning or assessment are relatively large and creative or at least non trivial and and uh, you know, in this category and they're just too big. We give students too big, too complicated exercises too early. Uh, and if you concentrate on the simple ones and give them a lot of practice at this level, you'll find that they will start to do the, they will then begin to work at the higher levels. Um, okay, so moving on to application, uh, which is on page 20 of the recommended pages that, are, that I've circulated to the organisers. There's a section on application, and you'll see once again that I've underlined and heavily highlighted some parts that are very important to me. So let's look at some of that. Right, a problem in the comprehension category. Hang on, Raymond, what's going on here? You said you were about to tell me about application and now you're talking about comprehension again. What's going on? Um, this is what's going on. Um, comprehension and knowledge I've just defined and I've done it in ways which are independent of the other levels. I've defined them in ways that are independent of the other levels. And you'll find that evaluation and synthesis at the other end can also be defined in ways that is independent from the other levels. The middle layers tend to be defined as how they differ from the other, from the, from the, from the bottom and the top ones. Um, actually, I met a psychologist years ago who said that this is a common property of lots of taxonomies, not just Bloom's taxonomy, but anything that forms a hierarchy. Um, it tends to be the case that the middle layers tend to be defined in how they are different from the other layers, and that's what you're going to see now. I'm going to define application by. Uh, by spending a, quite a bit of time explaining why it's not comprehension. So a problem in the comprehension category, so this is revision from earlier, requires a student to know an abstraction well enough that the student can correctly demonstrate its use when specifically asked to do so. Now, just let me back up for a second. When we were doing comprehension, sorry about this, I know this distracts some people. Um, I did say earlier, note well, all necessary information is provided in the question for the comprehension level. And now when we get to application, what you're going to find out is, yes, in comprehension, all necessary information is provided. Therefore, um, a student should be told that they need a certain abstraction. So, you know, a problem in the comprehension category requires a student to know that an abstract, know an abstraction well enough that the student can correctly demonstrate its use when specifically asked to do so. That's comprehension. The difference when we get to the application layer Application, however, requires a step beyond this. Given a problem new to the student, the student will apply the appropriate abstraction without having to be prompted to do so. You recognise from the material that a certain abstraction generalisation is required and you use it. That's the difference between comprehension and application. There's, there's now gaps, there's things missing. Um, it, the, the, it should be an obvious inference really, or it is an obvious inference to us, the teacher, that a certain thing is required, but the students got to demonstrate their grasp at the application level by showing that they realise that something's required. On continuing to the next page, page 21, this is kind of a repeat of what was on the previous slides, just said with different words. Um, but because you're getting used to this, 
repetition is often a good thing in different words. So a demonstration of comprehension, this is saying the same thing as the previous page. A demonstration of comprehension shows the student can use the abstraction when its use is specified. A demonstration of application shows that the student will use it correctly given an appropriate situation in which no mode of solution is specified. OK, so comprehension requires that all the information the student needs is, is given. Application, we're starting to make the student realise you know, what's applicable to a particular problem. So, oh, and also implied here, but not clearly, clearly stated, is application problems are relatively small uh, with limited scope for variation and correct answers. He goes on to talk about that several pages later, but it's not in, not in that section. Um, okay, so here's, I'm gonna illustrate an application question by taking a comprehension level question, and this is one you've already seen, and turning it into an application question. So comprehension, translate the following pseudocoded code. We did this before. For loop header where I runs from one to 10, print set the values in I, move the cursor to a new line. Okay, I'm gonna change that, but I'm going to change it in a way that I think still makes it a comprehension level question. The for loop, write code that prints out the numbers from one to 10. So I'm telling the student everything they need to know. That's why I think it remains a comprehension question. Now I'm going to turn it into a, to an application question. Write code that prints out the numbers from one to 10. So the student has to realize that they're going to need some sort of a loop to do that. You know, they, they have to realize that for themselves. And that's what makes this, an this that phrasing to be an application question. Um, now, I've added a little note for my own protection at the bottom. I don't think that's a very good exam question. If that was, I mean, for one thing, a student could successfully answer this question by not using a loop. They could just write a print statement which prints out the numbers from one to ten. Um, so I'm not saying to you that this is a good exam question, a well-crafted, well-worded exam question. What I'm trying to do is fit quite a lot of information onto a single PowerPoint overhead. So don't read this as an example of a good question. It's just I'm just trying to illustrate the fact that. There is implied knowledge or the student needs to make an inference for themselves. I leave it as an exercise to you, the student, to turn that into a better worded question. I mean, one way you might do it is simply to have the for loop run from one to 100. And I suppose even then some students would probably try to write a single print statement. But anyway, I'll leave you to, to try and figure out how to make it a better, uh, a better exam question. The thing I want to get across right now is that there is information left out. There's a generalization left out in the first two the first two, I would argue that they were comprehension because the student can use the abstraction of a for loop when its use is specified. But in that last one, in that application, uh, the student had to infer that for themselves. OK, what's next? Ah, OK, so again, I'm going to show you another example of an application level question, but um, uh, but uh, but uh, I'm going to do that by reminding you of a comprehension level question, and then I'm going to turn it into an application question. So you know, here's the missing code. Uh, here's the missing line. Select the right one. That was comprehension. All applications right code that moves the elements in array s one place left. Now they have to now they have to realise that they need a loop and they need to do a few other things as well. Um, again, that's not a very well worded question. Um, for example, they probably should be told something about what to do with the end, you know, the values on the end and so on. I'm not suggesting that this is a well crafted exam question. I'm just trying to fit something on a single PowerPoint and illustrate on that single PowerPoint slide the difference between comprehension and application. Analysis. Now, I've said it several times, but let me say it again, and I've got the dashed lines here to kind of remind you each time. Um, the, the six levels form pairs. Um, so when we talk about analysis, um, students are going to analyze, demonstrate their ability to analyze a, a piece of code. But furthermore, kind of what you've got to understand is that the code that they're analyzing in, in the analysis level is code that in theory you might have could have asked them to write at the application as an application level question. Uh, it's not a large open ended program that they're analyzing. It's a relatively small piece of code that you could have set them as an application question. Think of it this way. One student wrote an answer to an application question. We hand the student's answer to another student and that student has to analyze that code. That's one way of thinking of it. So the analysis here refers to analyzing small pieces of well defined code. 
Uh, and a good example of that is, you know, something I've given you before. Um, this was originally a comprehension question where this was the multiple choice missing line and he had a multiple choice. Now I'm going to give you all the code. So that would be an application question. Write me a piece of code that moves everything one place to the left. Um, now, how could I for, run, give this as an uh, analysis question? Well, here's one way. There are many ways, but here's one way. Well, there may be many ways. In plain English, explain what this code does. Um, do not give a line by line description. I just want to know overall what it does, and therefore a good answer from a student would be it moves the elements one place to the left. Now, again, you might argue that this is a bit vague uh, and you might want to tighten up this language uh, in a real exam question. That's fine. Um, I'm not trying to write a well crafted question. I'm just trying to fit on the single uh, PowerPoint slide an example that illustrates analysis. By the way, I'll have a lot more to say about explaining plain English questions in uh, talk two. I won't say anything more about them now. And again, just another reminder that the bottom two form a relative simple things that you've seen. Um, a little bit more going on in the uh, in the middle layers, and then when we get to the upper layers, we're talking about large and creative um, uh, exercises. Large and exercises that you know, if, if you set ten students to solve a certain problem, you'd expect. 10 solutions which differ in significant ways. And that's what I mean by creative. Um, you know, there are, there's more than one way to solve the problem. Whereas down in that previous level, there's, usually, there's not much scope for variation in the answers. There's some scope, but not much. But up here, you'd expect to see, you know, I mean, you know, when students write large programs and two students hand in the same program, we often recognize that it's the same, same program. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that you know if we if we have students writing uh, and they really are writing uh, their own code, then we don't expect to see the same solution at the last level. But equally, um, I believe that one of the activities that you you have to do at the moment we'll be doing is uh, classifying your exam questions. I can simplify uh, into the bloom levels. I can simplify um, that exercise for you by saying you'll probably only be using four levels because in general you can't ask synthesis and evaluation questions um, in an exam. Uh, or if you are, I would argue that that's just too hard, at least in the first semester of learning to program, introductory programming. It's, these are just big open ended questions that are just too hard for students in, uh, in an exam situation. Um, so that simplified your problem, uh, analyzing exam questions. I'm saying they probably fit into those four categories. You probably won't have many analysis. Most of your questions are going to be application and comprehension, I think. Right, but I will say something about synthesis. What did they call that in the um, create, didn't they? Synthesis, which of course was now the top, uh, yeah, uh, is placed at the top in uh, in the revised text. I'm the create category. I'm staying with the old word synthesis. Um, when Bloom and colleagues wrote that down, they said skill in writing using an excellent organization of ideas and statements. Now, Bloom and colleagues in 1956 were mostly concerned with kids going to primary school. Uh, so when they write skill and writing, I don't think they meant computer programs. I'm pretty sure they didn't mean computer programs. What they meant was, you know, the students wrote a little story about what they did on their holiday. Uh, and they hopefully would write it using an excellent organization of ideas and statements. But, you know, this works really nicely for programming, I think, as well. You know, skill and writing using an excellent organization of ideas and statements. That sounds just like, you know, good programming to me. And equally, ability to write creatively a story, essay or verse for pleasure or for the entertainment or information of others. Now, what you did on your summer holiday um, uh, might be for pleasure and for the entertainment of other people. It's a bit harder to, you know, I think you can write programs. I mean, if you're sufficiently geeky, if two or more people are sufficiently geeky, you can be writing programs for, you know, for, for pleasure and um, for uh, which entertain other people. But I think, you know, it's create creative is 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 a good word here. It's it's a large problem. It's relatively open ended. It um, you know, there's a lot of scope for variation. And as I've already said, difficult or impossible to ask synthesis questions in an exam. Difficult, maybe impossible. Better suited to assignment work. Finally, evaluation. Was that what they called it in the? Um, oh, I can't remember now. I'm sorry, but what what it's you know so. Bloom defined evaluation as the making of judgments about how well synthesis solutions are accurate, effective, economical. 
I've inserted the word synthesis here. Bloom didn't really originally have that. So it was the making of judgments about how well solutions are accurate, effective, economical, and satisfying. The reason why I inserted the word synthesis is because remember the, the levels, the six levels form three pairs. And I've already said that when we talk about uh, analysis, we're talking about analyzing code that could have been written as an application problem. Likewise, evaluation differs from analysis in that evaluation is uh, is, is a is uh, the evaluations being done on a synthesis uh, a style problem. So something that's large, open and creative. So for example, evaluation might be, in fact, I've done this. I've had students write, this is getting ahead of myself. I've had students write a large program um, at that, what I would regard as a synthesis level. And then I get them to swap with another student and the other student has to evaluate the, the solution. Um, and, uh, you know, so, one thing is, is is the ability to recognize say uh, a well a, a a nice decomposition of the program into a good set of uh, independent methods or procedures you know a well structured program um, that's not applicable to analysis the code is too small in the middle layers for the for, to start talking about modularization and you know cohesion and coupling and concepts like that um, up here it's only when it, it only becomes relevant up here uh, and like synthesis, I think it's too difficult to do as an exam, but it is practical to do as an assignment. As I said, I had students write big programs for synthesis, and then they swap with other students and, did, and they evaluate each other's. The other thing, apart from the code itself, that students can uh, evaluate is the um, is the, uh, um, the user interface, the usability of the code. It's something I really wanted to hammer very early on in programming, and that apart from the code itself, the students had to evaluate user interface. And that's about it. Oh, one thing I'll add, which I haven't put here um, on the slide, is that one thing that Bloom talks about is that this is an evaluation is not just, you know, in my opinion, this is a great program. It's not a it's not an expression of an informal You You do the evaluation according to um, uh, some some set of well defined problems, uh, some, some well evaluation criteria. Yeah. For example, if I was phrasing it as an evaluation question, I might say, um, analyze the program in terms okay. of cohesion and coupling between the modules, and the student would have to do that. So it's it's a well-defined uh, evaluation strategy. 